The City Arts Centre, nestled in the heart of Edinburgh's old town, is home to the City of Edinburgh's fine art collection. Widely recognised as being one of the finest in Scotland, it now numbers over 5,000 works of art and includes wonderful examples by many of Scotland's finest artists. Displays drawn exclusively from the collection feature regularly within the gallery's busy temporary exhibition programme and paintings, sculptures, drawings and prints are frequently loaned to other galleries in the UK and internationally. In this short video, we would like to show you some of our collection highlights. With so many to choose from, making the selection has not been easy. The collection continues to grow and new works are added each year by purchase, donation or bequest. Central to the art collection are views of Edinburgh, acquired over many centuries. And we'll begin our tour by looking at a small cross section of these. Alexander Naismith, 1758 to 1840. The Port of Leith, oil on canvas, 1824. Alexander Naismith was born in Edinburgh and started his career as an apprentice coach painter. He was multi-talented, for he worked not only as a painter, but also in other areas, including landscape design, stage set scenery and architecture. Above all, Naismith was a painter of landscapes. And this large picture is one of a series of major paintings of Edinburgh that date from the mid-1820s. Bathed in the golden glow of a midsummer evening, the city and its topography provide the background for the ships moored on the Forth. It's an image designed to show Edinburgh as a prosperous capital. The centre of the Enlightenment and an important trading hub with the rest of Europe. John Wilson Eubank, 1799 to 1847. The entry of King George IV into Edinburgh from Calton Hill. 1822, oil on canvas, 1827. Completed just three years after Naismith's magnificent seascape, this painting depicts an event which happened five years previously, in 1822. When King George IV landed at Leith in August that year, he was the first British monarch to set foot in Scotland since Charles II in 1651, a period of well over 150 years. Sir Walter Scott masterminded the arrangements, creating a hugely popular and colourful pageant. Artists flocked to Edinburgh to record the visit. Among them, Joseph Turner. Of all the paintings, John Wilson Eubank's dramatic portrayal is one of the most impressive. It's painted from a high vantage point on Calton Hill, looking down over the city where huge crowds have gathered to catch a glimpse of the grand procession. As light streams through the Bridewell prison, 
and cannons fire from Edinburgh Castle. The king arrives in an open-topped golden carriage on his way from Leith to the Palace of Holyrood. The visit lasted 21 days and included extravagant processions, fabulous parties, military reviews, and even a performance of Scott's Rob Roy at the Theatre Royal. James Howe, 1780 to 1836. Horse fair in the grass market. Oil on canvas, circa 1836. The excitement and chaos of the annual All Hallows Horse Fair in the grass market area of Edinburgh's Old Town is brought to life by Scotland's first great animal painter, James Howe. The castle, rising high in the background, provides the setting for this congested scene, an explosion of colour and incident. Right in the middle, and with his usual sense of humour, the artist has painted a portrait of himself painting the canvas of the travelling menagerie. James Howe's career was marked by great highs and lows. Born in the tiny hamlet of Skirling in the Scottish borders, his talent as an artist was spotted by the Earl of Buchan, who commissioned him to paint animal portraits. At one point, he took a letter from his patron to London, hoping to become the official horse painter for King George III. Sadly, he failed to win royal favour and he returned to Edinburgh, painting huge panoramas of far-flung places and events. Beset by poor health and financial difficulties in later life, Howe spent his final years here, in the grass market. And this painting was one of the few to remain in his possession at the time of his death. Robert Easton Stewart, 1890 to 1941. Moll's Corner After Rain. Oil on Canvas, 1925. On a rain-soaked, misty evening, a smartly dressed woman seeks shelter from the horrible weather in the gates of the Caledonian Station in Edinburgh's West End. This nostalgic scene is by a little-known artist Robert Easton Stewart. The view is towards Charlotte Square and St George's Church. To the right, crowds huddle around the window displays of the magnificent department store, Mall's Emporium. Robert Mall and Son was one of Edinburgh's best loved department stores. Its elaborate interiors boasted the finest tea rooms and departments ranging from chinaware, fashion to furniture. Famed for its crowd-pulling sales, this prominent landmark later became Bins and Sons in 1931 and then House of Fraser. Mall's department store has always been one of Edinburgh's favourite meeting places. Captured in the popular phrase of the day, meet me at Mall's. Anne Hill, 
Adam Bruce Thompson, 1885 to 1976. Northbridge and Salisbury Crags, Edinburgh, from the North West. Oil on Canvas, 1930s. This striking painting was presented to the City Council by the Society of Scottish Artists in 1935 and shows the view across the North Bridge to Salisbury Crags and Arthur's Seat beyond. Both the foreground buildings and the crags behind appear carved out of the same rock, a connection which no doubt the artist wished us to make through his use of such a muted range of colours. Adam Bruce Thompson had a long and influential career. He was a much respected tutor at Edinburgh College of Art and an influential figure in the Scottish art establishment. An Edinburgh man through and through, he was still painting in his 91st year. Kate Downey The Coal Yard Acrylic and Coal Dust on Canvas 1988 On the site of Bruce Lindsay Waldy's Rail Coal Yard This view of Haymarket Station on the west side of central Edinburgh is now no more. The painting was commissioned as part of a larger project in which a range of artists were invited to portray the changing face of Edinburgh and its people. This gritty view, painted with marvellous spontaneity and expression by the leading contemporary Scottish artist Kate Downey, captures a glimpse of the past. Coal workers linger as a truck refills from one of the many bothies. The busy east-west train line is visible in the distance. And the faint outline of the Pentland Hills can just be seen at the top of the painting. Haymarket is perhaps one of the most changed corners of the city. Today, this same view would include a new station, multi-storey offices and a tram line. Henry Kondraki, born 1953. The Red Park, oil on canvas, circa 1997. Henry Kondraki's paintings develop from a wide variety of sources, including his own family history, and are always marked by a childlike painterliness. The Red Park depicts an area of Edinburgh commonly known as the Meadows, a popular recreational area near to the city's university. In times past, the meadows contained a loch, known as the Borough Loch. And until 1621, when fresh water was first piped in from the suburbs, it provided much of the city's drinking water. However, for centuries it remained a marshy area where animals were grazed and where rubbish was dumped. Kondraki draws on these rather disturbing associations in this playful, vibrant composition. The ghostly waiter is a portrait of his father and he reappears time and again in the artist's work. William McTaggart, 1835-1910 to Running for Shelter Oil on Canvas, 1887. 
Leaving the streets of Edinburgh far behind, this next group of works were all presented to the city of Edinburgh in 1964 by the Scottish Modern Arts Association. The association had been founded in 1907 to acquire works of contemporary Scottish artists and to assist in the enriching of Scottish public art collections. By the 1960s, it had been superseded by the Scottish Arts Council and its collection was dispersed, the majority coming to Edinburgh. This painting of a storm-battered harbour was created by William MacTaggart, one of Scotland's best-loved artists. Born near Campbelltown in the west of Scotland, he was the son of a Highland crofter. In 1852, he entered the Trustees Academy in Edinburgh, the forerunner of Edinburgh College of Art. A pioneer in so many ways, he is best known for his impressionistic coastal scenes, landscapes and seascapes of local fishing communities. In this painting, a young mother and her family watch anxiously from the overhanging rocks as a small flotilla of fishing boats attempt to reach the shelter of the harbour before the storm strikes. The scene is glimpsed through a veil of descending cloud, through which light can only just penetrate, and where the little fishing boats are tossed like toys in the water. McTaggart well understood that while life at sea was often dogged by tragedy, it was of vital importance to these little communities. Robert McGregor, 1847 to 1922. Gathering Stones. Oil on canvas, circa 1877. From the western edges of Scotland, this next painting takes us to the fertile fields of East Lothian. Inspired by a contemporary French painting, the young artist Robert McGregor began to exhibit paintings like this in the 1870s. This painting depicts three women collecting stones to clear a field for planting. The carefully observed clothing, the leaden sky and the flat, featureless landscape all help to convey the unforgiving Scottish climate while reinforcing the hardship of such back-breaking work. The women are probably a group of bondagers who were farm outworkers, often the relative of hinds or male labourers. It was a condition of the hinds' employment that he supply a bondager, who would work to pay for the rent of a tied cottage. John Henry Lorimer, 1856 to 1936. The Flight of the Swallows. Oil on Canvas, 1906. One of the best loved paintings in the art collection. This could not be more different from the one we've just been looking at. In this work, the setting is not an open field, but an elegant interior. Kelly Castle in Fife provides the backdrop for this painting by John Henry Lorimer. The original tower house was constructed between the 14th and 17th centuries, but had fallen into disrepair by the time the Lorimer family began leasing it as a holiday house in 1878. John Henry's brother, the architect Robert Lorimer, undertook extensive renovations and in 1916 
John Henry took over the lease and lived there for the rest of his life. Here, the artist uses the castle's interior for an Edwardian family scene. A mother and her children watch as swallows fly above the rooftops, preparing to migrate to warmer climes as the summer ends. The portrayal of the little girl in tears hints at another meaning. With the departure of the birds, a symbol of the end of childhood and transition into the adult world. John Duncan, 1866 to 1945. Tristan and Isolde, Tempera on Canvas, 1912. The subject for this painting is taken from Celtic mythology and is typical of the work of one of Scotland's most unusual artists, John Duncan. The story surrounds Tristan, seen here in the right of the painting. Tristan was the child of King Mark of Cornwall's sister and Roland of Ermundy. As a young man, Tristan is wounded in a duel and having lain ill for three years, is taken to Ireland where he is cured by Isolt, also known as Isolde. Tristan returns to Cornwall where he tells King Mark of the beauty and grace of Isolt. He is then sent back to Ireland to solicit the hand of Zolt for his uncle. During their voyage back to Cornwall, Tristan and Isolde unwittingly drink a love potion that binds them together forever, even though Isolt does become King Mark's wife. John Duncan's work is unique in that there was no one else in Scotland painting in such a way during his lifetime. Born in Dundee, Duncan spent a time studying in Europe, and it was there that he first became aware of the work of symbolist artists, such as Puvis de Chavannes, Gustave Moreau and their followers. This is a fine example of his mature style, and it reveals a deep understanding and appreciation of Italian Renaissance painting, as well as pre-Raphaelite artists such as Rossetti and Burne Jones. Francis Campbell Boileau-Cadell, 1883 to 1937. The Black Hat. Oil on Canvas, 1914. Francis Cadell is often considered the most elegant of the group of artists known today as the Scottish colourists. Born and educated in Edinburgh, he studied art in Paris and Munich before returning to Scotland in 1908. Back in Edinburgh, he became well known for his paintings of spacious new town interiors and their stylish inhabitants. The Black Hat is a wonderful example of his early style. Using just a few colours, the scene is composed with quick, confident, impressionistic brush strokes. The elegantly dressed young woman is his long-standing muse, Don Wahope. She is carefully posed, leaning against a mantelpiece, and an added sense of light and depth is introduced by the reflection in the mirror, a compositional device often used by Cadell. Painted on the eve of the First World War, it depicts a way of life which was to be shattered by the coming conflict.
James Mackintosh Patrick, 1907 to 1998. Stobo Kirk, Oil on Canvas, 1936. In the 1920s, the Dundee-born artist James Mackintosh Patrick made his reputation as a talented printmaker. It was only when this market collapsed in the early 1930s that Patrick turned to painting in oils and watercolours. This painting dates from 1936 and it keeps the closely observed character of his etchings. The high vantage point and precise detail recalls the great masters of European landscape painting, such as Peter Bruegel the Elder. This scene is Stobo Kirk in Peebleshire, and he painted this little church on more than one occasion. In later life, Mackintosh Patrick painted out of doors, but at the time this was completed, his working practice was to make several drawings on the spot before assembling them into a final composition back in his studio. Interestingly, he has chosen to remove all the gravestones in the foreground cemetery in this finished piece. Stanley Kurzeter, 1887 to 1976. The Fair Isle Jumper. Oil on Canvas, 1923. We have already seen Francis Cadell's exploration of the female portrait in the black hat. This painting, by the artist Stanley Kurzeter, shows a much more realistic portrayal of the same theme. The sitter is Roberta Farquharson, who modelled for the artist on several occasions. Kurzeter stripped away the normal still life elements that were commonplace in his other portraits of the same period, so that we are compelled to focus on the model's distinctive clothing Fair Isle knitwear became really popular in the early 1920s. After the Prince of Wales was photographed wearing a Fair Isle vest in 1921. Alongside her bobbed haircut, Roberta's patterned jumper and hat accentuate her stylish fashion sense and youthful confidence. John Bellany, 1942 to 2013. The Obsession. Whence do we come? What are we? Whither do we go? Oil on panel, circa 1968. In the early 1960s, an Edinburgh lady, Miss Jean F. Watson, donated and then subsequently bequeathed a sum of money to enable the City Council to purchase works of art for its collection. One of the first purchases made by the Acquisition Committee was by a young artist not long out of art school, John Bellany. Bellany was born into the close-knit fishing community of Port Seaton, His father and grandfather were both fishermen. And from a young age, he was made aware of the dangers of the occupation. This powerful painting presents a group of fishermen at a gutting table. Their bodies strangely contorted in outline against a brooding sky behind. The composition deliberately recalls biblical scenes of the Last Supper. While the format, known as a diptych, 
also suggest a Christian altarpiece. The painting was completed not long after Bellany visited the Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland, an experience which deeply affected the young artist. The questions in the painting's subtitle, taken from a work by French painter Paul Gauguin, express the artist's deep struggles with the meaning of life in the face of such human suffering. Dorothy Johnston, 1892 to 1980. Rest time in the life class. Oil on canvas, 1923. When Edinburgh College of Art was established in 1907, Dorothy Johnston was among the first intake of students and she returned to teach there in 1914. By then, life drawing had gradually replaced the practice of studying the human form by examining and copying antique casts. This painting offers a glimpse into the life class environment, but also provides a series of contemporary portraits. The two girls in the foreground are Johnston students Kay Price and Bill Kilgar. And the model taking a rest is Poppy Lowe, a regular sitter at the college. A self-portrait of the artist features in the top right corner. Under the rules of the day, Johnston had to give up teaching in 1923 when she married the artist D.M. Sutherland. By then, however, her artistic reputation was already established and she continued to exhibit under her own name. John Duncan Ferguson, 1874 to 1961. The Blue Hat, Closery de Lilas, Oil on Canvas, 1909. By contrast with the Edinburgh trained Dorothy Johnston, Robert Duncan Ferguson decided to teach himself to paint. He first visited Paris in 1898 and had settled there by 1907. Living and working in the bohemian environment of Montparnasse, Ferguson saw firsthand some of the most avant-garde art being produced anywhere in the world at the time. The Blue Hat shows how Ferguson integrated these influences into his own work. Instead of carefully modelling the features of his sitter, Ferguson flattens her form into planes of vibrant colour and introduces dark outlines to enhance the overall decorative effect. The model in the painting has been identified as Yvonne de Kerstrat who worked in a Parisian fashion house. She is shown seated in the Closerie de Lilas, a local cafe that was popular with artists such as Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque. When this was painted, it was quite revolutionary in Scottish painting and Ferguson was regarded at the time as being at the forefront of modern British painting. Joan Eardley, 1921-1963 Summer grasses and barley on the cliff top Oil on board 1962. 
In 1956, the artist Joan Erdley took up semi-permanent residence in the small village of Catterline on the northeast coast of Scotland. The little cluster of cottages perched high on a cliff overlooking a secluded bay was to become a primary source of inspiration from then until her untimely death in 1963. Erdley immersed herself in the landscape, painting out of doors in all weathers, and often taking a deliberately low viewpoint so that it seems to us as viewers as if we are walking through the tall grasses. Erdley painted quickly, on board rather than canvas, and using layers of thick paint to create a richly textured surface. The Catiline paintings border on abstraction at times, but Erdley resolutely remained close to her primary source of inspiration. the natural and human environment around her. David Mack, born 1956, local hero, matchhead portrait of Richard DeMarco, matchsticks, 1992. The city's collection includes a small number of sculptures, of which this has to be one of the most unusual. The artist is David Mack, born in Fife, but now internationally recognised for his amazing sculptures and collages. Mack often works on a grand scale, building large structures out of shipping containers or gallery-sized installations that include an assortment of diverse components or sculptures made entirely from coat hangers. This is one of David's match-head portraits. The subject is Edinburgh-based gallery director and arts entrepreneur Richard DeMarco. The portrait was originally fashioned using a range of coloured matches in a tartan design. But, as with a lot of similar pieces, Mac then ceremonially set it alight. The charred result gives the work a new, more sinister character, although if we look closely, we can still make out the tartan pattern. Victoria Crow Born 1945. Last portrait of Jenny Armstrong. Oil on board, 1986-7. We end this brief tour with two very different works by women. Victoria Crow is one of the most highly respected artists working in Scotland today. Born in southern England in 1945, Victoria and her husband Mike moved to Kitlino. At that time, no more than a tiny group of cottages on the edge of the Pentland Hills. One of Crow's neighbours was the shepherdess, Jenny Armstrong. And over the next 15 years, she became a familiar figure in the artist's paintings. Over that period, Jenny grew older and more frail, until she was ultimately confined to one room in her little house. Last portrait of Jenny Armstrong was painted after she died and shows her sitting in her wheelchair in her tiny cottage surrounded by the things that were dear to her. It is a tender portrait of a woman of exceptional independent character, Rachel McLean, born 1987, Disunion, Digital Print, 2019. 
the city continues to add to its art collection. This final work in our tour is one of our most recent purchases and is by the award-winning artist Rachel McLean. Rachel was born in Edinburgh and studied at the city's College of Art. Since graduating in 2009, she has risen to become one of the most celebrated and sought-after Scottish-based artists. In 2017, she was chosen to represent Scotland at the prestigious Venice Biennale. Maclean's works often use vibrant, alluring colours, which pull the viewer into a world which promises much but then repels with her unsettling themes. This is one of three digital prints acquired by the city and the overall narrative concerns Brexit. The artist has created a series of characters, each representing archetypes in the debate. In disunion, animal figures, clad in the colours of the British Union Jack and French Tricolor, fight over a large blood-stained flag, seemingly ignorant of the bloodied bodies that lie strewn across the foreground and the small inflatable boat from which they have been thrown. It is, at the same time, both compelling and disturbing, throwing a poignant spotlight onto contemporary Britain. A fitting place to end our tour. We hoped that you enjoyed this review of some of the artworks in our collection. You will always find a selection on display in the gallery, so why not pay us a visit soon? We are in Market Street in central Edinburgh, right next to Waverley Railway Station. To learn more about upcoming events and exhibitions, visit edinburghmuseums.org.uk. Or follow us on Facebook at City Art Centre or on Twitter at at Eden Culture.